just want to start, first of all, by uh, welcoming everyone on behalf of 3CT, and also to thank Anu and Tommy, who's done really a fantastic job of setting up this um, event. Um, many of you here will know Keith through his published work. Um, of course, he's published widely and influentially on any number of topics, uh, ranging from uh, what became known as the informal economy, to his Ghanaian uh, ethnography, to reflections on money, systems of communication, and the mediation of human relationships in general um, in an increasingly globalized world. Um, Keith is really, I would say, sort of the embodiment of sort of the, the Kantian global citizen, not just in his intellectual projects, but because he's taught at a staggering variety of campuses around the world, um, several UK universities, several US universities, um, in Jamaica, in South Africa, and continental Europe. Um, my own relationship with Keith uh, goes back now to cover more than half my life at this point. Um, so uh, he was, uh, I would want to say that he was certainly my first and most important teacher of anthropology. Um, as undergraduates at Cambridge, my cohort really experienced Keith's teaching as the very antithesis of scholarly pedantry. Um, with Keith at the helm, anthropology was very much a project not of rejecting the Enlightenment project, as so many were doing in the name of critical theory, but rather of revitalizing it through a kind of radicalization from within. In a recent exchange just a few days ago, Keith described himself as a dialectical humanist, and, and I think that's actually quite apt. Uh, he is a humanist in the sense that he sees anthropology as the pursuit of what Hobbes called commonwealth, that is the pursuit of social forms that will enable the maximum vitalization of our individual and common uh, creative energies. But he is a dialectician too, because he has always refused both all intellectualist shortcuts to universal truths and the temptation of falling back on the romance of the local. Uh, his work on markets, money, and human relationships has always stressed how intimacy and alienation produce each other and how the very same institutions that close us off from one another can be remobilized to create new forms of community and connection. Um, I hope Keith won't think me silly or feel too embarrassed if I remind him that as a student, we were all very proud that he was our teacher. Whenever he was giving a lecture, we, his advisees, would look around at the other students and kind of nod at each other like, that's our guy up there. Um, I'm sure that we were much more intolerable than we actually realized at the time. But the, but the point is that 20 years later, I still feel exactly the same way when I read Keith's writing and when I see him in action. So it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome him um, before you here today, Keith Hart. The title is uh, Beyond National Cap Capitalism. <laughs> My basic premise is that humanity is caught between national and world society rather uneasily. Uh, this constitutes danger and opportunity for us. And uh, it's an important framework for my anthropology that I should place myself between in that way. What I want to discuss today is what I take to be the dominant uh, global social form for the last one and a half centuries, which I call national capitalism. <clears throat> Towards the end of its uh, reign, uh, national capitalism created world society in the image of the old regime as a violent and unequal society. And this leads me to question, to raise the question of whether uh, perhaps there might be grounds for another liberal revolution against this degenerate form, this old regime. Uh, if there is a possibility of such a revolution, then it will be based on social forces that have been built up recently and these uh, social forces will have to find new forms of political association which I think is the most pressing problem 
So, my talk is, apart from these introductory remarks, is going to be based on, is going to take the form of three sections. The first will um, concern the origins of national capitalism. The second will uh, uh, look at its subsequent development to the present day. And the third will be concerned with uh, questions of what might happen next. But before I launch into all that, um, I wanted to make some brief remarks about my approach to money. Um, my, I, my money uh, uh, is archetypically impersonal. It has to be um, in order to connect us to the widest universe of our social relations. Um, but I have argued that uh, we do develop personal relations with impersonal social forms, and so do we with money. Uh, so for me, money, I mean, if you have some money, you can do anything with it. It's, it has infinite potential. But as soon as you use it, to, say, to purchase something, you close off uh, that possibility. So is this ability to mediate between finite determination and infinite potential that constitutes for me uh, the most important uh, feature of money and one that it perhaps shares with language and religion in uh, its own way and, and some similar ways. In other words, in a world which uh, sometimes glorifies money uh, and, and sometimes uh, demonizes it. Uh, what I have been looking for and uh, is, is some of its redemptive qualities. Because I believe that money is essential to any future civilization that we would wish to be part of. And yet it's also highly <coughs> oppressive in the forms that we encounter it today. Okay, uh, my definition of, of national capitalism um, is the use of central bureaucracy uh, to manage accumulation of markets and money. National capitalism is the institutional synthesis of the nation-state and industrial capitalism in the mid-19th century. It was launched by an alliance of capitalists and landlords. As you, as you know, the original bourgeois or liberal revolution um, was launched by capitalists in some presumptive alliance with the workers against the landlord class. Uh, but having succeeded, and this was of course the project of classical political economy, uh, but having by the middle of the 19th century in Britain and some other places uh, succeeded in launching uh, industrial capitalism uh, quite strongly, they faced, uh, uh, the capitalists faced a, a burgeoning urban mass uh, that needed to be controlled, disciplined, absorbed or whatever. And so, in a series of linked political revolutions of the 1860s, uh, leaking over into the early 1870s, uh, national capitalism was born in all the countries that became the leading players in 20th century history. And the two classes that formed its, its launching uh, combined between them the universality of money, and money's ability to extend social relations universally, uh, and uh, the classical 
uh, ability of the military aristocracy to control territory, uh, to act as agents of crowd control, if you like. Now, the urban masses that they had to deal with on an unprecedented scale um, constituted, of course, the industrial working class. I mean, mechanization did concentrate very large numbers of proletarians in cities. But uh, uh, there was also a very significant problem of criminal gangs in many of the, the, the leading cities. And they uh, needed to be controlled as well. I, I don't know many works of fiction that capture uh, the birth of national capitalism. Uh, but one of them is uh, Martin Scorsese's uh, Gangs of New York, uh, which was uh, a film made on the basis of a book by uh, Herbert Asbury of the same name. Uh, this film starts in 1863 in the middle of the American Civil War, which was by far the most important of the revolutions that I'm talking about, and I will list them soon. It opens up with uh, uh, rows of coffins on the side of, uh, uh, of the docks in, uh, in, in, in New York City, and Irish uh, immigrants uh, being recruited as they stepped off the ship to join the army and, and find their own place in one of these coffins. And uh, the film is about the, uh, this extraordinary turning point in American history in New York. Uh, around that time, uh, uh, conscription was introduced because the Union Army was in, in great, uh, in dire straits. And uh, this provoked uh, street riots. Uh, the army marched down uh, Fifth Avenue, shooting indiscriminately into crowds. Uh, it spilled over into America's first race riots, uh, largely Irish, poor Irish, uh, um, lynching uh, blacks, uh, black refugees from the South who were offering unwelcome competition at the lower end of the labor market. And to crown it all, uh, the Union Navy bombed southern Manhattan from the East River, from battleships, uh, as a way of subduing uh, a territory that was um, under the control of criminal gangs, Irish in the main. Um, the film ends uh, rather beautifully, I think with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and his girlfriend sitting on the other side of the East River next to some tombs of friends and relatives who have been killed in this episode. And they look over towards Manhattan as it was then. And the last shots of the movie, uh, Scorsese fades in the contemporary Manhattan skyline, uh, reminding us that um, New York's uh, variant of capitalism had this rather violent and brutal origin. What it reminded me, of course, is that we know that the American Civil War was, as it were, the struggle of the industrial bourgeoisie against uh, the slave-owning aristocracy, and perhaps also uh, uh, had an agenda of disciplining the, uh, uh, the working class. Uh, but there were other issues that had to be resolved at that time. And of course, in London, in the 60s and 70s, similar developments, but perhaps less extreme methods, uh, uh, were, were, were present. So to validate my idea that, that these revolutions were linked, I'll just tell you what the events were that I considered to be these linked to uh, revolutions launching national capitalism. <coughs> the American Civil War was by far the most important one. In 1861, in the same year, Russia abolished uh, serfdom and the Italian uh, Risorgimento was 
um, consummated. Um, later, uh, the Japanese had their Meiji restoration, the British introduced the Democratic the Second Reform Act and various democratic reforms and perhaps even more significantly uh, launched the Anglo-Indian uh, superstate in uh, uh, 1870. Germany, of course, was unified at the end of the decade, immediately launched the Franco-Prussian War and uh, after that the French uh, Third Republic uh, arose from the ruins of that war. And of course in the same decade, uh, uh, in the same decade, uh, Marx uh, published the first volume of Capital and the first international was formed in 1864. So what it suggests is that uh, all of these things, although apparently independent, were taking place uh, in a way that suggested world society had some measure of linkage. Although um, Arthur Lewis in his Economic History of the Period uh, suggests that uh, the, uh, the, the virtually almost all countries uh, had a maximum of 1% of GDP attributed to foreign trade. And even in Britain, the linchpin of the global economy, the most reliable indicator of annual economic performance in 1870 was the weather at harvest time. What was the nature of this uh, alliance? Obviously, the capitalists uh, had launched a successful machine revolution, concentrating more and more workers together in urban centers of production. What they needed was uh, um, an adequate uh, threat of punishment, uh, both for workers who uh, uh, wished to be independent in their conduct, and also to, well, to secure contracts of all kinds, how to make an, a, a plausible threat uh, uh, if people didn't pay up, for example. Um, they, they needed, in other words, armies, prisons, police, and all the uh, 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 apparatus of coercion, and were not in the position to supply this themselves. And so, after at least a century and a half in which the liberal agenda was based on the assumption that most workers' interests were identical with those of capital against the uh, rentier military landowning class, um, uh, the capitalists uh, ganged up uh, with that class uh, in order to secure some kind of control of the situation that they launched. But it wasn't just a, a, a coercive regime, although violence certainly was intrinsic to its birth and, and reproduction. Uh, national capitalism also rested on co-option co of the, the working class. And this was by cultural and social means. In other words, uh, the nation-state uh, mobilized its citizens uh, by reference to national culture and uh, at a very early stage uh, uh, moves were taken to extend social security to at least some sections uh, of the working class. I mean, Germany is by far the most striking example of this form, although it it uh, exists in all the countries that I've mentioned. Uh, Germany was an alliance between the Prussian Junkers of Berlin, uh, the military, and uh, uh, with the uh, Berlin-based uh, bureaucracy, and the Rhineland bourgeoisie. Uh, so that 
that duality uh, was very explicit uh, in Germany. Something similar uh, occurred in Japan at around the same time. Uh, Bismarck, as you know, uh, apart from being a soldier, uh, in his uh, career as a statesman, uh, launched the first systematic measures of social security, uh, unemployment benefits, and so on, the beginnings of the welfare state. So, uh, and of course Germany uh, played a, a, a very significant role in launching uh, cultural nationalism as a means of uh, mobilizing and unifying people divided into various political uh, uh, political uh, uh, entities. I just, I mean, one of the things in my work that has, uh, is, is, is uh, banal in a way, but I want to remind you how powerful the nation state is and has been as a, a form of human community. And it's powerful because it unifies uh, several uh, senses in which uh, we can uh, mobilize community. First of all, it's a political community. It creates a, a body of citizens. Um, secondly, uh, it's a, a community of interest, uh, mobilizing its people in, uh, in war and trade. It's a territorial community, a community of place with uh, definite boundaries between inside and outside. And it's a virtual or imagined community, a, a nation that uh, has to be fabricated by one means or another. And it's not obvious that these four things uh, uh, should necessarily overlap. And indeed, one of the principal symbols of this overlap is the formation of um, uh, national monopoly currencies around this time. I mean, this uh, has been so durable uh, uh, and, uh, for, and omnipresent for us that it's counterintuitive, I think, for us to realize that um, in ev everywhere in the world before the 1850s, uh, human societies uh, combined multiple currencies derived from various sources. Um, Polanyi, uh, in his uh, discourse on on money, pointed out that the it was only really at this time that the four functions of money as uh, means of exchange. Uh, uh, standard uh, uh, means of payment uh, and store, uh, these four things came to be embodied in a, a single monetary instrument. He argued that you could not uh, write the origins and development of the history of money uh, unless you broke up these uh, four functions and, and showed the history of each separately. And uh, there's some interesting work being done uh, recently uh, suggesting that uh, even though it was as recent as this, that national monopoly currencies may be, uh, uh, may be uh, uh, breaking up again, that, that the functions may no longer uh, be unified in the way they were. So it, became, it becomes a very... Uh, 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 it becomes a, a major analytical problem as well as a political one for us to try to identify um, the different forms of community, the different functions of institutions like money uh, uh, and, uh, 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 and, and to think of them in plural uh, rather than centralized and unified terms. It's my premise that the future that we may be entering uh, will involve uh, such a shift.
let me talk in, uh, now about the historical periodization of national capitalism. I'm claiming that its origins were in the 1860s and <coughs> early 70s. I then identify four phases. One was from the 1880s to the outbreak of World War I in 1914. Then there was the period that Churchill referred to as the Second Thirty Years' War, uh, from 1914 to 1945. Then after 45 until the 70s, uh, another phase, and then from the 80s until now, uh, uh, the fourth. And I think um, many of us feel and are prepared uh, intellectually to embrace the possibility that we are in 2008 and 9 we're living through uh, the end of that phase and the beginning of something else. So let me describe briefly these four phases. Uh, the first phase saw uh, what we might call a, a bureaucratic revolution. This was the period in which strongly centralized states were formed and the new legal framework for conducting business was um, developed. So this was the period, just to take uh, the United States in the 1880s, where uh, corporations, uh, on using the 14th Amendment, uh, won the right to be treated as individual citizens. So uh, this period of uh, 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 the late uh, 19th, early 20th century um, uh, saw the emergence of a, new, of, of, of a new bureaucratic and institutional form of the alliance that had launched national capitalism. It was a period also when central banks uh, took their definitive shape and began to organize finance uh, domestically. But this period uh, of the three decades before the First World War was uh, marked mainly by extraordinary uh, international movement. This was the period of the greatest migration of Europeans and Asians. Um, it was a period of financial imperialism, uh, not unlike the one that we've just uh, come through. In other words, what we saw in this period was, a, was the development of, of strengthened uh, 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 bureaucratic institutions, the shift towards large-scale governments and business organization, mass production, uh, mass consumption. This was the period also when uh, department stores came into being and uh, buying and selling moved from the shop floor to a remote managerial apparatus. This is the period when fixed posted prices uh, replaced uh, 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 haggling and uh, over credit uh, with the shopkeeper uh, for the simple reason that the people selling on the shop floor had to be controlled remotely. Uh, but it was also, as I say, a period of globalization, as we would call it today, uh, uh, and marked by what uh, um, uh, uh, Polanyi referred to as haute finance, by which he really meant the Rothschilds. Um, uh, uh, and although it was a period in which uh, national expansion and imperial uh, uh, territorial control uh, uh, led to considerable conflict between the principal powers, I mean, essentially provoked by the <coughs> extraordinary combination of Britain and India as a single political power. Nevertheless, this was a period of general peace between the powers. Uh, the First World War uh, revealed, I think for the first time, what this institutional complex was capable of. People didn't really believe it before, and it was still the case that liberal uh, economics uh, held the sway of most people's minds. In other words, people haven't yet worked out what these institutions could be used for, but the First World War uh, demonstrated in no uncertain terms what had been unleashed. I mean, states uh, recruited and killed off huge armies, 
they control the production and trade, they uh, 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 mobilize the hitherto unknown uh, um, instruments of propaganda. So that by the end of the First World War, it was very clear that something had been launched uh, that had powers that had been undreamt of before it. And uh, so in the period after the First World War, um, various forms of this new uh, state uh, variant of national capitalism vied with each other for, uh, essentially, for world dominance, as you know. Uh, fascism, communism, and welfare democracy, if you want to call it that. Uh, in any case, the period between the wars was, and the two wars themselves, were an unmitigated disaster, uh, economic, political, moral, uh, and so on. Uh, so by the time it was all over, uh, the winner was national capitalism. Well, that wasn't uh, uh, so difficult since all the three contenders were variants of national capitalism. Uh, communism under Stalin had become a form of state capitalism in one country. Uh, fascism obviously was an extreme nationalist uh, version of, of national capitalism and uh, well, uh, welfare state capitalism, welfare state democracy was the perhaps we would say the more benign variant of this form. And indeed it was this last one in some uneasy uh, relationship with um, uh, the Soviet Union that emerged victorious from the Thirty Years' War. Uh, Eric Hobsbawm in his book An Age of Extremes, the short 20th century, uh, refers to the period from 1948 to 73 uh, as a golden age. Uh, this uh, it certainly was, uh, if, uh, uh, you, if you consider um, the world from the point of view of the principal agents of national capitalism. It, it succeeded, the Rooseveltian success, su consensus succeeded because a coalition of the leading industrial states, including uh, the vanquished Germany and uh, Japan, um, essentially agreed simultaneously to expand public expenditure, uh, thereby creating uh, the largest uh, coordinated uh, boom in trade uh, ever. Uh, but of course this was also the period of the Cold War. I mean, before we get nostalgic about uh, the, the, uh, uh, the trade boom and uh, the general prosperity, the, the, what the French call uh, les trente glorieuses uh, 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 from 1945 to 75. Uh, this was also a period in which uh, most of us uh, you know, wondered whether we would survive the next year uh, as a result of the threat of nuclear holocaust. And uh, I think one of the issues that we have to face and that perhaps I won't be uh, developing uh, so well today is uh, what was the relationship between uh, this period and the one that followed it, the, the period that we uh, refer to uh, uh, rather glibly as neoliberalism. I'll be coming back to that uh, question. The last three decades you could essentially consider them to be uh, 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 a revival of financial imperialism of the sort that existed before the First World War. It was also, I, I, I would argue, um, a period in which uh, world society was drawn palpably together, and I guess that's the meaning of globalization, that the world seems to be drawing closer. I mean, it seemed to be drawing closer um, in the time of the French Revolution and Kant and 
uh, and the abolition movements and so on, it certainly uh, was drawing closer in the decades before the First World War. And the last three decades uh, 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 have uh, a similar. I, nevertheless, and I, I can't really uh, take the time now to, to demonstrate my point, would like to argue that uh, world society has uh, been formed concretely to a degree that it never had before. That is to say, uh, the formation of a single unified uh, social network is uh, a feature of really the last two or three decades. I mean, uh, the whole period since the Second World War contributed to this. I mean, the uh, space race in the 1960s uh, allowed us to see uh, the world from the outside uh, for the first time, which I think has enormous uh, symbolic uh, significance. Uh, uh, but I would like to focus on three uh, 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 developments of the last uh, two decades uh, as uh, uh, particularly important in this respect. The first was the collapse of the Soviet Union, opening up the world as a whole to transnational capitalism. The second was the entry of the peoples of India and China, the two billion or more of them, uh, into the world economy as powers in their own right uh, for the th first time. And the third, of course, was the digital revolution in communications, whose most palpable uh, symbol is, is the internet, the collapse of time and distance in the formation of a new digital network of communications. Uh, but this period, uh, uh, the last three decades, uh, was also one in which uh, the uh, aspirations of the post-war uh, consensus, the period after 1945, uh, were really quite seriously let down. The late 40s saw not only the formation of the United Nations, but also the launching of the anti-colonial revolution in Asia to be followed later in Africa and, uh, and other places. Um, and I think that the experience of the 30 years war uh, led my parents' generation quite decisively to reject uh, uh, most of uh, what they had been uh, asked to live by in the period before then and to make a very serious attempt to uh, uh, redress the inequality uh, of world society through what I consider now to be serious uh, uh, programs of development and, uh, uh, and of course uh, emancipatory reforms including uh, independence from colonial rule. Uh, the last three decades on the other hand have seen a reversion to uh, inequality on a an impressive scale and to lawlessness and an abandonment of the uh, democratic consensus of the late 40s, uh, which as you all know, uh, took an extreme form uh, in uh, the last decade, um, when I think the form of the old regime was uh, recreated quite uh, explicitly with um, uh, the second Bush and Halliburton uh, reliably occupying the slots of George III and the East India Company. Okay, um, let me go on to uh, uh, what may, how we might begin to think about where to go from here. Um, I have taken from various sources uh, especially uh, Marcel Mauss and uh, Karl Polanyi, uh, the idea that one of the principal functions of money and markets is the extension of society beyond its local uh, uh, form. That is to say that uh, a society uh, usually takes some kind of territorial form, but these uh, places are never self-sufficient. They must engage with the rest of the world. And in order to do so, they have to find a variety 
of instruments for trading with them. And uh, whether we call them money or markets or uh, insist on differentiating them was an issue that most took up with Malinowski. He, he found it convenient to, uh, to describe the polo ring, for example, as, as, as a market organized by money. Uh, but in any case, uh, the extension of money and markets uh, that took place in the last three decades has a, a positive as well as a, a negative side. Um, we know the negative side. It's very easy to see that uh, uh, as society uh, loosened its moorings in the nation state, uh, those who controlled access to finance uh, enjoyed the, the opportunity to enrich themselves in, in a deregulated uh, uh, way. There's no question about that. And they did so in ways that endangered us all and that we're now suffering from. Um, but there is a positive side to this, uh, something like the credit boom that we've gone through. It's, uh, it was a period in which uh, uh, markets were extended and integrated on a scale that had never been known before. And um, I find some interest in comparing the last three decades with uh, other booms and busts in the history of capitalism over several hundred years. I mean, for example, the, uh, the railway booms of the mid-19th century, the various gold strikes, the wild rubber boom, uh, earlier the uh, tulips and uh, South Sea bubbles and so on. I mean, all of these can be described as a rational exuberance or, or, or animal spirits uh, uh, naked greed, or whatever you want to call it, leading to tears before bedtime. Uh, but uh, there were always uh, solid institutional residues of these uh, things. I mean, we did get continental railways, we got industrial uses of rubber, we got colonial empires, uh, stock exchanges, a gold standard, a mild <coughs> inflationary gold standard that sustained world trade. Uh, for a number of decades. So, uh, I think it's important to, before we uh, launch some uh, vendetta against the people who enrich themselves unconscionably at our expense in this period, we need to reflect on which aspects of uh, 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 the global economy they, they created uh, we wish to retain, or whether we wish to return to the fragmentation and the uh, narrowness uh, of the society that preceded it. In any case, uh, the fallout of the uh, crisis that we're living through is that private capital, especially the banks, has been have been severely weakened. If we're thinking of the two uh, planks, as it were, the alliance between big money and state power uh, that launched national capitalism, private capital, especially the banking system, has been severely weakened. Uh, the initial knee-jerk reaction is to turn to the political institutions, the national governments, the central banks, uh, alone and in uh, alliance uh, to try and solve the problem using uh, varieties of Keynesian macroeconomic techniques. Uh, I'm convinced that these will fail. Uh, I, 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 I can't believe that the political class uh, that supervised what we've just been through uh, will have the flexibility or the nous to get us out of where we are now. Um, and if they do fail, which I confidently expect they will, uh, then both sides of 
the national, uh, uh, the alliance that formed national uh, 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 capitalism would be uh, in disarray. And of course it's not just the institutional power, power of classes, but the intellectual he hegemony of liberal economics has been uh, damaged uh, irreparably. Their slogan of Tina, there is no alternative than an extremely narrow conception of how to run a market economy, call it market fundamentalism if you like. That has been damaged, I would say, at least for a century. Uh, and as I've said, nor is it likely that a simple reversion to Keynesian solutions drawn from the 1930s will work because in the 1930s economies were still substantially <coughs> national entities and the, uh, and the techniques of uh, manipulation he developed were uh, suited to that. Um, I don't think that our economies are national in the same way uh, anymore. And so what I uh, am looking towards uh, is a more plural approach to economy, certainly not to a radical revolutionary agenda which says that we can uh, move in one leap from national capitalism to its opposite. Um, and I believe that uh, both Mose and Palanyi uh, argued that uh, all the human possibilities for economy coexist at any time, uh, but particular forms of them uh, become dominant and are often elevated to exclusive dominance in ideology or theory. Uh, but the fact is that uh, uh, all the different ways in which human beings have and perhaps might uh, organize their economic affairs continue to exist side by side and it can be one of our programs uh, to explore new institutional emphases and combinations <coughs> between them. That's the, the line uh, that I take but also uh, I have to say that I think that uh, Marx and Weber uh, are looking a lot better than they did until recently as a result of the uh, uh, they always look good to me, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, 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 uh, I think that uh, uh, I think Weber, in particular, uh, 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 is, uh, comes out of it as actually a, a more supple and interesting variant of Polanyi, uh, and of course the rereading re of Marx is another uh, essential task for us. So let me kind of summarize. Um, what, how can we identify the social forces that have grown up in the, the last period of national capitalism and what might, role might they play in any uh, uh, new period, phase or whatever. I mean the first most important one is that we're living through the period when capital became globalized for the first time. I don't mean that capital uh, traversed the, the world for the first time, but that the, the significant capital uh, uh, was accumulated in, 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 in many parts of the world for the first time, and not simply by Americans and Europeans. Now it may well be that Brazil, Russia, India and China will seize uh, this moment of institutional weakness in the North Atlantic uh, community, you might say, to uh, uh, launch their own uh, variants of national capitalism. That would be perfectly uh, predictable. Um, I think one of the things that, that, that occupies me, if only at a journalistic level, is to try and figure out who the winners and losers are likely to be in this um, uh, uh, period when it shakes down. Uh, I'm absolutely sure that America will not be a loser, uh, but I think the permanent and major loser of this crisis will be Europe. I think that the European political economy is unsustainable. Uh, the single currency uh, 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 offers a rigidity that means that countries like Austria, Spain, Ireland, 
uh, are being thrown to the walls uh, to save uh, the Germans' notion of what uh, fiscal probity uh, should be. Uh, uh, Eastern Europe is, uh, is, is a disaster. Uh, and it's unlikely that the Western Europeans will do much about it. They're not even, the Northern Western Europeans are not so sure whether they're going to res rescue what I sometimes think of as Club Med, the uh, uh, Italy, Greece, Portugal, Spain, and so on. So, uh, and they don't have a political mechanism, uh, even constitutionally, never mind practically, uh, to deal with the uh, forces that have been unleashed. And of course, the Europeans uh, were grotesquely overexposed in the emerging markets, especially in Latin America and Eastern Europe. So, uh, 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 and, and you know, they can't reproduce themselves. They hate the people who come to work for them. Uh, uh, they, they, they cling to their stupid little sovereignty and national identity above all other things. And I really think that by the time it's all shaken up, um, Europe will be off the map. Um, the second thing that I, 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 uh, I would, would, would refer to is uh, one of the major uh, developments of the last 30 years has been the rise of federated regional trading blocs, like the European Union and NAFTA, uh, ASEAN, Mercosur, and so on. It's my great hope that the Africans uh, might even be able to draw on their uh, traditions of Pan-Africanism to form a more effective union in this respect. But all of this uh, move towards trading blocks is a recognition of the inadequacy of uh, uh, nation states for managing relations with the global economy. And so uh, it represents, uh, I think, uh, an interesting uh, example of the principle of federation, uh, which might be uh, posed uh, uh, constructively against the national monopolies that we've been more familiar with. Much of my work is concerned with the, the impact on the forms of money and exchange of the internet revolution. Uh, I can't say a great deal about this here, although I've written quite a lot about it. What I uh, believe is that the digital revolution is rapidly making new combinations of personal and impersonal uh, uh, aspects of society possible, and it's doing so through one of the uh, great moments in economic history when a significant commodity is radically cheapened. I mean, in the first industrial revolution, the significant commodity was textiles. In this one, uh, uh, it's the transfer of information. And I do believe that the cheapening of the cost of transferring information uh, carries with it radical uh, consequences uh, for the um, organization of almost everything, um, but uh, uh, especially forms of uh, organizing money, markets, association, and so on, um, communication on the internet. I believe that this, I mean, in the, I moved from Cambridge to Paris in the late 90s, and uh, I thought, well, you know, if I'm going to lose the benefits of a cushy institutional life um, and in order to occupy an attic in Paris, uh, then I ought to sort of have, you know, write about something significant. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, so I asked myself what it is that future generations will, will be interested in us for. Why would anybody in future be interested in us? And, and I, I do believe that this moment in which we explore the first uh, uh, stages of 
of the development of a universal system of communications uh, is uh, in the history of humanity has a significance uh, parallel with that of the invention of agriculture. And if you use the invention of agriculture as an analogy for the situation that we may have stumbled into, uh, then obviously it takes place over a time period which uh, massively extends beyond our own uh, lifetime experience. Uh, so I, I mean, I, the way that I think of it, however, is that we uh, are like the first uh, digging stick operators who began scratching in the ground. They had absolutely no idea what Chinese civilization was, uh, uh, even though it was a, a tale somehow in this move, and nor do we. But nevertheless, uh, we have this historic opportunity uh, to make huge mistakes and even some small successes. And uh, I think that's how we should think of it. Uh, that uh, we should be modest in what we seek to achieve, but we should also realize that that, that social forms are emerging at enormous speed uh, uh, that we should insert ourselves into, learn from, and uh, consider the possibilities of. Um, and that's more or less what I've been doing. Uh, I wrote a book on money a, a decade ago called The Memory Bank, and since then I've been working quite extensively on alternative forms of money, complementary <coughs> currencies, community currencies, uh, open money, call them what you like. I uh, have spent a good deal of time with, um, uh, I think, a, a genius in this field, Michael Linton, who invented the first uh, uh, local exchange systems in 1982-3 in, 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 in uh, Vancouver Island. Uh, I do believe that the collapse of the banks uh, as long as we can make sure that Goldman Sachs loses their grip over the American government, uh, uh, offers a, 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 an unrivaled opportunity. Uh, for, and I think the, 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 the soon to be revealed failure of the, center banks, the central banks to uh, 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 act effectively um, uh, um, opens up a, a tremendous uh, a uh, moment for us to explore new principles of association uh, through trading circuits and money. Uh, and all of those, I think, are entail, entail in uh, this digital revolution in communications. Finally, of course, there is the issue of the global institutions. I mean, it's clear that for a long time, um, the present Woods institutions have served only the purposes of a few Western capitalist nations and, and in many cases only the United States. Uh, they urgently need reform, but I'm not sure whether uh, the reforms that are needed will be, uh, will arrive before uh, uh, a significant deterioration of the peace. I know that uh, presently journalists and academics and intellectuals um, think about the parallels between our situation and the 1930s. What uh, worries me is the parallels between our situation and the end of the last period of three decades of globalization and financial imperialism in 1913-14. Market fundamentalism is dead, that's for sure. Uh, maybe Keynesianism is too soon. Uh, one obvious contender to fill the void is uh, environmentalist ideology, green uh, thinking. Um, uh, clearly that is stirring and it has a focus in, in global warming and the need to conserve water and many other uh, scarce resources, 
Uh, I haven't said much about uh, this green ideology and its uh, uh, potential in the period that com is coming up, um, partly because I'm very much aware of its roots in um, rather pernicious uh, uh, phases of our history. I mean, it comes out of that Aristotelian uh, synthesis that supported the rule by the uh, military landlord class for millennia, uh, the pioneers of, uh, of, of green programs in 20th century Europe, as you know, were the Nazis. And uh, uh, I, I do believe that the intimate relationship between uh, um, the ideology and theory of uh, nationalism and the nation state and uh, green ideology uh, need to be examined perhaps more critically than, than they often are. I also hope that anthropology, which for too long has been trapped in uh, a fragmentary, uh, 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 in ethnographic fragmentation, um, uh, uh, might lead, uh, that we might be able to generate a as one uh, offshoot or complement to the academic discipline, uh, an interdisciplinary uh, uh, move to develop new ways of uh, um, identifying what we need to know about humanity as a whole if we are uh, to make a better world. I think that, that if I can summarize my, 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 my relationship to all of this as an anthropologist is that uh, I believe that anthropology has its a sort of Kantian mission uh, to illuminate uh, the world society that we may or may not uh, succeed in making. And it has always been that to some degree, no, no, never more uh, strongly than in the century of his birth, in the 18th century Enlightenment, when it was linked uh, directly to the transcendence of unequal society and the formation of more equal and democratic societies. Uh, so uh, I, I, I hope that, uh, without wishing to, to claim that all anthropology should uh, be concerned with this, I think uh, uh, a program similar perhaps to a, pro a program like development studies or area studies that is able to mobilize intellectuals from a number of disciplines uh, might be able uh, to take up this question as its object and uh, perhaps inform uh, uh, um, a world uh, which has greater staying power than the one we've got at present. I like being protected. Okay, all right, I'll keep the bad guys in uh, I think if you see the internet as the prohibitor of the descent back into the dark ages, which you find in Colin Murphy's uh, Are We Wrong? A reworking of Gibbon for a contemporary unified world. And you say that this is the first unified, but the unified known world is actually wrong. But I take your argument to mean that it's the internet that's going to continue to create, prevent the uh, creation of isolated units of uh, middle age uh, culture and civilization and so far as church is present. So the internet is, is a counter to that reworking of the given Colin Murphy, are we Rome argument that we're bound to uh, descend into smaller units of organization. You said something about that. Uh, uh, just a question in respect to the Gibbon Cum Murphy argument about, and a lot of other people, that we have a kind of dark ages coming upon us again. The second question is, what about uh, something like the American military that has 175 or 180 bases throughout the world? How does this military uh, establishment? Uh, figure into your analysis? Um, 
Okay. Um, my 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 method has been to uh, look at some of the uh, institutional developments that we encounter, and not to make predictions about which of them will necessarily uh, uh, prevail, but to identify them in terms of their democratic potential. I mean, it, uh, many of the developments of the uh, internet give uh, considerable power to banks and large corporations and governments and so forth, and not necessarily to bottom-up and uh, decentralized organization. So, uh, my, my, you know, I, without wishing to make a prediction as to, as, to, as, as, as to whether we will win or not, I, I do, yes, believe that uh, the digital revolution in communications uh, uh, has um, the potential uh, uh, to um, to spawn um, uh, significant initiatives in this area, which I could be more specific about. It's not just the internet, of course. I mean, uh, mobile telephony in places like Africa uh, uh, have been bursting out in, in, in all kinds of interesting ways uh, for the very good reason that mobile phones uniquely of the new technologies have a built-in payment system. The internet does not have a built-in payment system, and that's one of its uh, 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 liabilities. I mean, Twitter is all the rage, but they're losing money. And uh, uh, so, uh, uh, generally speaking, yes. I mean, I, without wishing to predict that we will uh, avoid the dark ages, if we wish to, it seems to me that there are some promising developments. <coughs> Moreover, I mean, uh, in the last 30 or years or what I mean the, the internet grew up as an association of military and bureaucrats and academics for several decades. In other words it was the kind of epitome of the old regime. Uh, and it's only kind of escaped from that in the early nineties. Uh, uh, so you know I I I uh, I, 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 I so yes I I, I I without wishing to be uh, uh, Panglossian about it. I, 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 I am hopeful uh, in that respect. You asked about the American military, which would probably require another lecture from Marshall Salmons. But the, uh, uh, I mean, I, I can give you, you know, if you want, but that you don't. Um, uh, uh, where World War Three is going to break out, and uh, and and you know, well, I tell you now, it's going to break out in. In, in Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan, which has the great uh, uh, um, 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 opportunity of being next door to Russia, India, uh, China, the Muslim world, and where you know the Americans and the, uh, the Europeans already have substantial military build-up. Uh, uh, so, I mean, it's my belief that. Uh, that national capitalism will not go down uh, uh, peacefully and that the American military will be an agent of the uh, reaction. Yeah, I mean, that, that was a, a, a gross oversimplification. I, I was 
sort of summarizing uh, Marx's uh, journalism on the American Civil War for the New York Post at the time. Um, uh, and I'm sure that uh, uh, any uh, American historian would be able to give a more nuanced uh, picture. Uh, but I think the, uh, the general argument uh, uh, why Marx, uh, and I don't you know, claim this as a factual record of American history, why Marx thought the uh, uh, American Civil War was the decisive victory in what he called the bourgeois revolution was because uh, it was a, a victory for the, um, uh, uh, the free labor system, the wage labor system on which he developed, you know, to which he devoted a great deal of attention. And, you know, I, I'm not an expert on the period, but the, the trigger for the war, which was whether some of the new western states uh, should be, uh, permit slave owning or not, with consequences for the balance of power in the Senate, uh, I think were informed by uh, some of these considerations, um, if not in the simple way that I suggested. Uh, all that I was trying to point out, however, is that uh, 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 that kind of Marxist uh, um, industrial capitalist uh, story um, kind of bypasses another one that was practically and has been practically very significant in, in the history of this city and New York and uh, many others around the world, which is the, uh, the power and efficacy of criminal capitalist ga gangs uh, operating outside the, uh, 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 the, the, the purview of the state. And that was, I mean, that's, I only just wanted to point out that what I was trying to say was that, that, that that, that uh, uh, Scorsese's fiction uh, drew attention to the significance of that in the context of a war that has often been described in, 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 in rather different terms. Uh, which form do you see for the labor movement in the developments of the global situation? Uh, well, yes, I mean, we, we uh, surely the, uh, I mean, if one, I would have to tell the whole story. The labor movement was a major uh, contributor to the first phase of national capitalism and the pressure for the development of welfare state, social security, and, 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 and so on. Uh, the labor movement was also significant in the second 30 years war. And it became, and it reached uh, its apogee, as, as it were, in the period of social democracy after 1945. Uh, now, the, 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 this leads us then to asking what happened in the 1970s. And uh, there are different uh, analyses of that. Uh, but it looks like um, uh, that the kind of class compromise uh, between capital and labor and government that, uh, that was engineered after the war, really on the backs of working people winning the war, uh, uh, was uh, first of all challenged and threatened and then overthrown um, in the revolution that we associate with Thatcher and Reagan. Uh, now why uh, 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 the labor movement uh, um, has been so thoroughly weakened in the last three decades is another interesting question. Uh, but one of the, uh, uh, certainly within the framework of neoliberal capitalism, uh, uh, I mean, wages have uh, stagnated or regressed, uh, uh, the pattern of employment has shifted from uh, stable and secure long-term employment to uh, poorly paid, fragmentary, and casualized work, and so on and so forth. So, um, uh, it, I mean, I think that the the labor, and I, I, it, my answer is I don't know, and it's something that I haven't uh, drawn a lot of attention to in my own work. 
mainly because, you know, I mean, I have been in my life a Marxist and I'm very sensitive to Marxist arguments and there are lots of people ready to say, you know, what's all this about the services economy, industrial manufacturing is still as important as ever, you know, work and labor is the key to the politics of everything, and I say, yeah, 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 you know, go on studying Facebook and Twitter. But, uh, but I, I, I think it's a very good question, and I'd be interested if anyone else, or you, wish to make a, a point about it. All of the uh, previous stages to the coming one that you analyzed were in terms of class relations uh, and, and the struggles of the different, different classes. My question is, uh, what, what do you think is the vanguard of your of the coming era? Uh, is, are we are we now in a classless? Uh, or a different kind of uh, struggle than the, than all the previous. Era. Well, I, 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 the way that I, the way that I, 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 I approach that is by asking if the classes of uh, classical political economy persist in our world, and. Um, that is land, labor, and money, like land, la landlords, workers, and capitalists. And, and I think they do. Uh, certainly, um, the landlord uh, function has evolved to the nation state uh, forms of government, as I've been describing. Uh, capital has evolved to uh, the scale of uh, large corporations in some uneasy relationship with those uh, governments. And so then the question is, what is the third category? Labor, workers, people in general. And uh, um, Marx and Engels' uh, line on this was to argue that there were some sectors of the world economy which were uh, forward-looking and dynamic and that the classes being formed there, in particular the industrial proletariat, uh, would play a decisive role in, uh, in the future. I think, you know, they were mistaken on that. So, but, but what I would like to retain is the logic of the inquiry, which is where are the vanguard sectors of uh, the world economy today, and who are the people, you know, sort of, moving them, and could you claim that these might be some elites uh, capable of uh, pushing things forward and making an alliance with others? And, uh, you know, my... Uh, so, in other words, I mean, you know, the answer would be, if, if, if it were yes, that it's the wide, you know, the, the geeks, the, uh, the people who are pushing open source and uh, free software and uh, trying to create uh, conditions of liberal association uh, on the internet against all the constraints uh, uh, levied against them. But then, um, you know, I asked myself, well, uh, maybe the history of the, I mean, maybe the history of the last 150 years is not the best analogy for us. What if world society in its decadence and inequality and violence has become something pretty similar to the old regime before the French Revolution, French and American revolutions. And what if uh, uh, the only viable response to that is the liberal revolution? What were the liberal revolutions? These liberal revolutions were basically a ragtag and bobtail army of all kinds of uh, dissident elements, you know, diggers and whoever else, in the English case, uh, Gary Baldi's army and another one. Uh, but in every case, in the American uh, English 
French and Italian liberal revolutions, capital played a very major part. Uh, the border, you know, the slave uh, capitalists, uh, Bordeaux and Nantes, uh, and so on and so forth. And so that then raises the question, where are we in the history of capitalism? And uh, uh, my belief is not very far. I mean, uh, I have no time for, for people who, you know, say, you know, that capitalism is, on, you know, is, is dying, and it's on its last legs, it might be dying you know, in some parts of uh, Europe and uh, North America, but it, 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 it's busting out in many other places. And if, as Hegel said, uh, the, uh, the world historical mission of capitalism is to bring uh, 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 cheap commodities to the masses and break down the traditional insularity of rural communities, well, it's still the case that two billion people work with their hands in the fields and, uh, and, and two billion people have never made a phone call in their life. And who is going to produce that for them? Some Sandinist movement? Who's going to throw up a satellite for them? So uh, my view has been for some time that the class analysis has to uh, identify within capital uh, some fragments that would be supportive of uh, um, a general liberal uh, revolution of the kind that might be necessary. And there are. I mean, if you take the, 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 the key um, industries like, um, uh, I mean, the internet-based industries, I mean, a, a firm like uh, Sony or, or Warner Brothers constitutes a, feudal barons of the most extreme kind trying to impose uh, ancient restrictions on the use of, of these commodities. But others, I mean, like Hewlett Packard, for example, I mean, a long time ago decided that they would try and reach the four billion poorest people on the planet, which meant that they would have to establish research stations in, uh, in, in China and Africa and so on, capable of adapting uh, uh, these uh, 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 new technologies devised for a market such as this to those purposes. So, I know it's a long-winded answer, but I, 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 it's a great question, and I think there are several ways of going about it, but you have to have um, a sort of theory of history to be able to answer it. And uh, I mean, mine is that, that capitalism is uh, actually entering into a a vigorous period of its development, but no longer controlled by the West, and um, uh, and, and that you know that that, that that it is creating a constituency for a liberal revolution. That's my belief. Not against capital, but with some parts of it. Okay, so we have three questions that have been waiting. One in the back. So we have three questions that have been waiting. One in the back, then Jim and Michael. So, yeah. um, so like, I don't follow any talks about sort of the follow of commodity money and the replacing of it with this concept of like purchasing capital money. Um, the forms of money that you were talking about, like you know, uh, working with like community money and all of these things, uh, would you say that they fall into the category of purchasing uh, capital money, or are they something? Um, but that, that you've asked me a, a hybrid question that is difficult for me to answer because the first part of it requires me to talk about how I conceive of uh, the relationship between what uh, 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 Polanyi called token and commodity money. But I'll, I'll, I'll skip that for the moment. It, the, the, it, briefly, the the. Uh, uh, the main contrast uh, uh, between uh, existing currency forms and, and the alternative forms that I've been interested in and explored uh, 
is that so the, the, the forms we're familiar with are issued by single agents. And the forms that I'm interested in are, are issued uh, by participants, uh, plurally. In other words, people create money by, by means of making promise to repay, if you like, in the future. Uh, there's no question that uh, the aim of these uh, uh, currencies is to increase purchasing power. Sounds by, like credit reforms. Hmm? Sounds like credit reforms. Well, I mean, you know, I, I can hardly... I mean, one of the things that I found in this, I mean, people like Michael, who has devoted his life, or should I say, wasted his life, to a vision of money as being inevitable, that, uh, that kills us all in various uh, small and big ways. I mean, when I try and talk about this, I immediately provoke derision and, uh, uh, you know, uh, and so on from people who, who actually can't afford to inspect their own uh, assumptions about money. And it's very difficult to persuade people in a couple of sentences at this late time in our association of what the principles are and how they work. But uh, you were asking me basically whether they were purchasing power they fell in uh, uh, Polanyi's uh, classification of money as uh, pur purchasing power monies, and I would say yes, but, but perhaps that's not the most important feature of them. Jim and Mike. I want to go back to games, and, and um, uh, it seems to me that we're seeing in this ferment that we have right now uh, an expansion. Uh, a plethora of gain kinds of activities on, on a global scale. And I'm wondering if you could you know, comment on if that's, if that's in fact not an exaggeration, uh, how you see this in relationship to, to the transition you see going on. So I've missed the question. Uh, the, this, uh, how you see the relationship of this expansion of gain or Expansion of gang, gang activity. Gang, okay, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's, that's as you say, you know, as Oscar Wilde said, the Americans and the English are divided by the common language. Common language. <laughs> uh, the, the, okay, sorry, sorry. So back to that Scorsese moment. Yeah. Gang and the state. Yeah. Gang and the state uh, relationship. Um, where are we now? How do you see that operating? Um, well, I, 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 I think that the neoliberal period and its commitment to deregulation and the diminishing power, you know, power of states to control especially international commerce and capital flows uh, gave rise to uh, a radical informalization of, uh, of the global economy. Uh, um, I'll tell you, you know, about one of my gangs, if you like. I mean, I know uh, a, a, a gang in Marseille and Montpellier of North Africans who basically boost uh, cars, especially German cars and car parts, and sell them throughout Africa. And they, uh, they have a strongly Islamic... Uh, 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 they have a strongly Islamic... Uh, ideology and practice, they never use anything, any paper or any kind of visible manifestation of their transactions, it's all words. Um, the, the, the level of their trade has reached a, a point where the French uh, spare parts industry, uh, Renault, uh, Peugeot and, and Co, has moved south to meet the demand except you would never understand from the official statistics why there was this migration of capacity mm -hmm. towards a non-existent uh, uh, demand. Uh, recently these gangs have, have, have hooked up with Russian and uh, Latin American mafias and they've expanded into Brussels and Hamburg. Uh, in the latter case, as a, a much more reliable place. Are they listed on NASDAQ? Hmm? Are they listed on NASDAQ? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I mean, the question arises: How do you, how do you, you know, find out about and study these phenomena? Or, I mean, to take another one which has been referred to, 
uh, uh, the Bourid of Senegal, who are uh, 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 following of a 1920s uh, Sufist saint uh, who uh, uh, control a large amount of the street trade in uh, southern Europe and uh, New York and other places. Uh, I mean, at one time in the, uh, you know, in the last decade, I mean, they, they supplied a large number of the shoes into North America through Harlem uh, and decided to switch their sources from Italy to China uh, with profound effects on the Italian national economy. Uh, so so what, what I'm saying is that uh, the kind of gangs that played such a prominent part in 19th and early 20th century American economic history, and perhaps even still do if you watch The Sopranos. Uh, 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 I mean, this, this phenomenon, the criminal organization of unregulated uh, trade is, is enormous. I mean, the, the opium trade coming out of Afghanistan through Iran has, has wrecked that country. I mean, the, the, there is a war going on between uh, gangs running the opium and various state army factions and a large amount of it is staying in Iran, and people are getting blasted on it. And you know, so, so, so I think that uh, uh, the con you know, I think in the last 30 years or so, uh, the conditions for uh, criminal commerce uh, have expanded ra radically. And we're not even talking about you know former Soviet army, you know, gun runners into Angola and the Congo and all that sort of stuff. I mean. It's huge. Future, which in some ways is the negation of a stylized version of the present, so that uh, you know we will make the leap from capitalism to something post-capitalist, non-capitalist, or whatever. And I was contrasting with that trope, if you like, uh, a vision that says that uh, that uh, you know that all forms of economy coexist in with different emphasis. And that if we're moving in a new direction, it will not be uh, 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 too. Uh, um, it will, won't be to uh, social forms that are in some radical sense new. Uh, in other words, I'm, I'm, I, I mean, the analytical question for me is: uh, What is it that national capitalism has become for us? which is not necessarily an integrated or functional or coherent thing, but what are the elements that it has, you know, uh, sustained, and I mentioned some of them, and, uh, uh, and how can we uh, um, um, conceive of new forms of political association, new uh, combinations of economic strategy that are adequate to our dilemmas? Uh, that that was uh, so, it's, uh, so. It's the complement, in a sense, in some universe of possibilities for possible economic worlds. You might say. That you're well, about. It's yes, not I mean, opposite, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm saying that you know. I mean, I'm talking again. I mean, I mean, the way that I'm sorry, the way that I, 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 I mean, some writers 
like Marx, uh, for example, uh, <laughs> to take a random example, say, you know, first we had feudalism, then we had capitalism, then we have whatever. Hegel, on the other hand, and a number of others said, well, you know, family-based uh, organization related to the land, urban commerce, uh, state politics, all these things, you know, have a different relationship and structure of ascendancy and so on at different times, but uh, they coexist, and, and, and so we, we have to devise ways of combining them. And I was really just, uh, uh, without having anything specific in mind, I, I, mean, I mean, there are people, I mean, the anarchist uh, wing of the internet uh, society is quite strong in, in one form or another. They're mostly libertarians, though. They're libertarians, but they also talk about a non-capitalist future. Notwithstanding, they're libertarians. <laughs> That's to say, they imagine it in a market form. Well, some of them uh, weirdly imagine the anti-market, too. David Graeber, for example. You know, so, so, yeah, but, but the, 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 Larry Lessig. <laughs> Larry Lessig, yes. Well, I mean, what, what interests me, Larry Lessig is a very good case. I mean, you know, I, I think that, uh, uh, I mean, I, I, I think that the, the struggle over intellectual property rights is, is one of the, 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 the concentrated uh, arenas of class and other institutional struggle. And, uh, and I'm, you know, part of it. I mean, every time that I publish an article... Good patent lawyer was really worrying about this. But, but the, 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 the <laughs> thing that I worry about with Creative Commons licenses is that it reproduces the license culture. Sure, that's the point. Yeah. <laughs> and in the end, it makes work for lawyers. And I'm not sure that this is, you know, so the future that I'm going to buy into. There's a class fraction interest. <laughs> exactly. Well, following on this uh, <laughs> nourishment, I think the time is right for refreshments. So please come.